is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 A man wants to find out about taking part in a dragon boat race. Listen to the conversation between the man and the woman and answer the questions. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Scope Charity Office, how can I help you? Oh, hello. I'm ringing about the dragon boat race that you're asking people to take part in. Oh, yes. We still need a few more teams. Are you interested in joining the race? Yes. We want to enter a team, but we don't know anything about it. Could I ask you for some more information first? Of course. I don't even know when it's being held. <laughs> it's taking place on the 2nd of July. Is that a Saturday? No, it's a Sunday. It's a much more popular day and more people can take part then. Right. And where's it being held? At the Brighton Marina. Oh. Uh, I'm an overseas student. Could you spell that for me? Yes. It's uh, Brighton Marina. That's M-A-R-I-N-A. -I Do you know where it is? I'm not sure. It's a couple of miles past the Palace Pier. Oh, yes. I know it. You take a right turning off the coast road or you can cycle along the seafront. That's good. What time does the race start? Well, the first heats begin at 10am, but you need to register half an hour before that at 9.30 and we really recommend that you aim to be there by 9. It's a good idea to arrange a meeting place for your team. Right. And the race is to help raise money for charity? It is. We're asking every team member to try and raise £35 by getting friends and or relatives to sponsor them. Every crew member will receive a free tournament T-shirt if your team manages to raise £1,000 or more. Oh, that's quite good. Also, we're holding a raffle. Every crew member who takes part in the race this season will be entered into a free prize draw. Oh, what's the prize? It's pretty good. It's a holiday in Hong Kong. Sounds great! The man asks for more information. Look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen to their conversation and answer questions 6 to 10. Is there anything else you need to know? Uh, could you just tell me a little bit more about the teams? Well, you need to have a crew of 20 people for your dragon boat and you then need to agree on who's going to be the team captain. That will probably be you. Fine. Um, I've got a group of 20 people who are interested. Do all the team members have to be a certain age? Well, there's no age limit as such, but if you have a team member who's under 18, then they have to get their parents' permission to take part. Yes, that makes sense. 
It isn't dangerous, but we do have boats that turn over in the water, and for that reason, we need to insist that everyone wears a life jacket as well. And you can hire life jackets from us when your team arrives. What do you advise people to wear? Well, most people wear a T-shirt, shorts and trainers. I certainly wouldn't recommend that you wear jeans or boots. In fact, it's a very good idea to bring some spare clothes. OK. It can get quite cold and wet if the weather's bad. And there's quite a bit of hanging around, especially if you qualify for the semi-finals or the final. <laughs> I see what you mean. Have you got a name for your team? Oh, not yet, no. Well, you need to decide on one and then put it on the entrance form, which I'll send you. Oh, OK. So, if you'd like to give me your address, I'll be happy to send details first class. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear some announcements made to a group of people who are planning a trip to Greece. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning, everyone. I'm getting very excited about this trip to Greece, and I'm sure you are too. As you know, we didn't have all the details at our last meeting, but I can give them to you now. We'll leave London Gatwick Airport on British Airways next Wednesday. Please be sure to be at the airport by 6.30. I know it's early, but our departure time is 8.25am. We're quite a large group and we don't want to have any hassles. Please be sure to have all your travel documents ready. We'll arrive in Athens at 2.25 in the afternoon and there'll be a vehicle there to meet us. It'll be a full-sized coach so everyone can travel together. We'll spend three full days in our hotel in Athens although we're only being charged for two nights' accommodation, which is good news. The second day, we'll go to the National Archaeological Museum to see the enormous collection of ancient Greek works of art, antiques, statues, a brilliant display. We'll eat out at a typical Greek restaurant on Thursday night. It's going to be a very busy time in Athens. Friday morning and afternoon, we'll visit historic sites, but we have nothing planned for the rest of the day. On Saturday, we're off to the islands, the Greek islands of ancient myth and modern romance. Now the big news. At first, we thought we'd take the ferry, but we've been very lucky to secure a sailing boat, which is big enough for all of us. I'm really excited about this part of the trip because we'll see the islands to the best advantage and we'll be able to cruise around and sleep on board. We'll get off at different islands and for one part of the trip we'll have people playing Greek traditional music actually on board with us. Now I'll pass out a brochure with all the details. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. A lot of work has gone into organising this tour and I'd like to thank in particular the travel agent who got us a really good deal and the people at the British Museum who offered us such good advice. Trips like this only happen because of the hard work of really expert people. As you know, we have planned a gathering for when we return. I have a list of things which the committee would like you to bring to the party. They are your pictures and something to eat for everyone to share. You are almost bound to have people ask what we have in common and why we're travelling as a group. I suppose the answer is that we're interested in learning about old societies and vanished cultures and we all enjoy travelling. Of course we enjoy fine food too, but that's not as important. Oh, I nearly forgot the last piece of information. You'll see there are labels which I have passed around for you to put on all your luggage. Could you fill them in please? On the top line please write Greek Tour. And on the lower line, write in block letters, I mean uppercase, the letters AA and the number 3. That's double A3. We need to have these labels clearly displayed to help the baggage handlers keep our luggage together on the different parts of our trip. So please don't take them off. That is the end of part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between a moderator and two students. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Today we will hear two views of the book Fast Food Nation, The Dark Side of the All-American Meal by Eric Schlosser. Many have deemed this a fascinating socio-cultural report that explains how the development of fast food restaurants has led to the standardization of American culture, widespread obesity, urban sprawl and more. Well, I think that Schlosser's book promises a lot but delivers less than a highly hyped fast food meal. The book is not well written and it lacks organization as it skips around in its telling of fast food horror stories. And then he spends a great deal of time on Walt Disney and bashing Disneyland. Why is that in a book about fast food? Bashing is the best word for this book. According to this book, Schlosser clearly believes that the fast food industry is responsible for every problem in America today. From the common cold, to inflation, to malls, to unruly kids, to warts, he blames it all on big business and especially the big food business. The book is written in a breathless, alarming motive that makes it sound like McDonald's and Disney are co-conspirators to take over the world and force every living child to eat greasy french fries. Give me a break. Schlosser is also very biased for the left, praising unions while ripping right-wing values and Republicans. Nixon seems to get special attention. Just having your picture made with him gets sinister prose and makes you a co-conspirator. Despite claims of research, there are numerous blatant assertions such as Parents in the 80s spent more money on their children because they felt guilty about not spending time with them. How does he know that? 
Is all consumer spending on kids really driven by guilt? The book is a farce. Save your money to buy a Big Mac and read something else. Only read this ridiculous book if you are an anti-Republican, anti-big business, there are evil forces everywhere subverting the world fan. Thank you, William. Now look at questions 26 to 30. As the talk continues, answer questions 26 to 30. Now we'll talk to another person with a very different assessment of this book. So, Jenny, what did you think of Schloss's book? Wow, where do I begin? I thought that this book was very informative, very well researched and a very easy read. Schlosser did a wonderful job of organising the vast amount of information that he placed in this book. For a non-fiction book, I found that Fast Food Nation kept me entertained throughout its entirety. In fact, I couldn't put it down. The history of the fast food industry itself was fascinating as well as the background information on the potato and meat industries. The first-hand accounts given by people who work for the fast food industry, as well as the meat packing and potato plants, added to the reality of the points the book was trying to make. The fast food industry and all industries supported by fast food companies have some serious issues that need to be addressed by the nation. In addition, Schlosser does an excellent job of pointing out the dangers of not only working for these businesses, but eating food supplied by them. It's scary to think about the dangers lurking behind the counter at your local fast food chain. This book really opens your eyes to some health hazards that all of America should be aware of. Everyone should read this book. It will change your eating habits and the way you view large fast food corporations. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about the Inuit Eskimos of Alaska and Canada. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon. In our lecture today, we will continue our study of people who inhabit the northernmost regions of the world. Our focus will be on the native inhabitants of Alaska and Canada, the Inuit Eskimos. They have been called the native inhabitants, as the Inuit were the people who had most recently migrated across the gap between Alaska and Siberia. Distinctly Asian in origin, the Inuit, which is literally translated the people in their native language, developed their civilization in what is now the Bering Sea region about 1,000 years ago. Their culture spread eastward and is called the Thule culture, after the place in northern Greenland where archaeologists first discovered it. The first Europeans to meet Inuit people were Norse settlers in what is now northern Newfoundland, Canada. These settlers lived there for a short time around 1000 AD. 
Approximately 500 years later, beginning in the 1500s, European whalers, fishing crews, and explorers met many Inuit along the coast of Labrador. Russians and other Europeans first met Alaskan Inuit in the 1700s. One hundred years later, in the mid-1800s, whalers began to hunt in the Arctic. Some Inuit were employed by whalers and traded with them during that time. Perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the Inuit is how they were able to survive and grow in such a harsh Arctic environment. Firstly, and not surprisingly, their homes were well adapted to the freezing conditions. They lived in predominantly two types of housing that would keep them warm. In the cold summer, they would live in tents that were made from the skin of the animals they had hunted for food, and they also traveled in boats. These were called umiaks by the natives. In the winter, they would live in houses made of sod, and when on hunting trips, they would commute by dog sled and build temporary houses made from ice. These igloos, which is the Inuit word for house, were uniquely made with a sharp blade carved out of walrus tusk. They would cut large blocks of hard packed snow, about three meters wide, out of the ground. The blocks would then be used to build a six meter dome over a wide, shallow hole. Within one or two hours, an igloo up to ten meters in length could be built. It was weatherproof and large enough to house an entire family. Very early in their history, they managed to develop the technology to hunt the huge bowhead whale, which was the staple food source for them at that time. They also hunted walruses and seals. On land, they hunted polar bears, moose, and various other game. The harsh environment in which they lived meant that a steady supply of food was often difficult to come by. Therefore, the Inuit were a people constantly on the move looking for food, which meant that their dwellings had to be easily built and easily dismantled. They inhabited the wide open land and, as such, moved freely around it in search of food. Today the traditional way of life has basically ended for the Inuit. They live in wooden homes rather than in snow houses, sod houses, or tents. They wear modern clothing instead of animal skin garments. Most Inuit speak English and Russian, some speak Danish, while fewer still continue to hold on to their cultural roots by passing on to the younger generation their native language. The kayak and umiak, their principal means of travel, have given way to the motorboat, and the snowmobile has replaced the dog team. The combined percentage of the Inuit population in Alaska and Canada stands at 63%, the latter being 29% and the former around 34%. Some Alaskan Inuit live in towns and cities, but the majority live in small settlements and hunt and fish for most of their food. Most of those in Canada live in towns and housing provided by... That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.